everyone for having me. Um, I am a Georgetown alumni. I'm actually a double Hoya. I have a um, MS in biotechnology and then an MBA from Georgetown as well. Um, I'm currently working at Janssen Pharmaceuticals. Uh, so that's the Johnson & Johnson pharmaceutical arm. So happy to talk about that and how I got there. I just wanna share a little bit about me before diving into the broad topic of various careers in pharma, biotech, and med device. Uh, the reason why I'm here to talk to you about this today is one, Jody and I very, I, it seems serendipitous, but we met and you know I've been very eager to contribute and give back because I remember being in undergrad or even graduate school and having no idea what I could do with a bio degree outside of becoming either a doctor or working on the bench and in the lab. And so love to share that there's a, a ton that you can do in science and want to see as many Hoyas enter science as possible because I, I think it's healthcare is gonna continue to boom over the next few decades. So great industry to be in. Um, so just to share a little bit about me and why the heck I might be qualified to come talk to you. Uh, so I've been working crazy enough for about 12 years now. Uh, I actually, because I, I didn't know any better, I graduated from Penn State with a um, uh, bachelor's in biology, and a minor in math, and I didn't know any better, so I went to go work in a lab. So I actually worked at the G Georgetown Lombardi Cancer Center working on breast cancer drug target discovery. Uh, really great opportunity. I knew eventually I wanted to be where business and science met, but I wanted to get a good te technical foundation. Also, I didn't, I didn't know what else I could do, so worked in a lab. Uh, from there is where I got my master's in biotechnology as well. So I worked full-time and went to school part-time uh, while getting that master's. I parlayed that into a job at a small biotech company just up the road from you guys up in Rockville area called Mesoscale Discovery or Mesoscale D Diagnostics, depending on who you talk to. Uh, they work on biomarkers and assays and, and they create custom assays for customers to help support clinical trials and to help support research. Uh, so again, really great opportunity there. And, I, and I, I'll touch on each of these roles a little bit more later on. Uh, I'll use them as my jumping off points uh, to share what kinds of roles were available at those particular uh, institutions. Um, from there, I went on to work at a nonprofit. So the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health or the FNIH, also up in Bethesda, Maryland, so not too far from you all. It's only about 60 people, but it manages all of the major private public partnerships between large pharma, biotech, FDA, NIH. Um, and it's a, it's a great way to get your hands dirty and really do some really innovative science. So really cool, small nonprofit there. Um, but you can see when, when you choose your career, you, you can jump around, do different industries, different sectors, no problem. I don't think that whatever you choose first is what you have to stick with. Uh, from there, I decided to take a break. I actually went to pursue my MBA full-time back at Georgetown for a host of reasons. Um, one of those was to explore other career opportunities and figure out what I wanted to do and why I was doing the things I was doing in life. It actually led to me writing a book. So that's Redefining Success. Jody already allo alluded to this. Uh, just by being here and registering, um, if, if I can get a list of email addresses, I can send you all the ebook. You can give it a read. If you like it, leave a review. If you don't like it, I'd also love the review and, and the feedback just to hear your thoughts, but uh, you'll have that in your inbox soon enough. So thanks, thanks for the support. Uh, but that was really my way to explore what, what's next, how I wanted to set up my life and be a bit more purposeful around my career. You can see, I see my career as a really winding road and hopefully you're all, you all will see your career that way too. We all think, at least I did early on that, Careers were supposed to be very linear in a straight line looking upwards. Uh, and that's certainly not the case for me as I like to jump around and get all sorts of different experiences. Uh, and that's how I wound up at Janssen after doing some searching and, and figuring out what mattered to me in a role in my private life. Uh, Janssen was the perfect opportunity. I joined them through a leadership development program. What that means is I get to rotate every 18 months to different uh, parts of the organization. So right now I'm in new products and business development. What that means is that I am in the group responsible for helping with pre-market commercial strategy. So I'm currently working on a drug that's supposed to launch in 2025. 
Uh, it's a beast of a, of a compound, uh, 12 different indications across four different therapeutic areas, ranging from neuroscience, immunology, maternal fetal medicine, rheumatology. So really, really fun, uh, cool opportunity to learn. But we also help to inform our business develop, development opportunities. Um, so I'm working on actually oncology there. So uh, using AI to help de-risk and identify potential areas for us to invest in for our lung cancer portfolio. So really cool opportunity. I'm actually about to rotate to my next role. That'll probably be in oncology as well. My hope is to work on the CAR-T product that we have in line doing some marketing, uh, but that will remain to be seen. Uh, so that's me in a nutshell. You can see I have a pretty broad uh, array of, of career experience ranging from everything from basic research to now commercial strategy. Uh, so happy to talk about any of that. And be but before I do that, I wanted to share a little bit about the book, what I found in my journey, and, and hopefully it sets the stage for, as you think about your next step in your career, things that you should be considering. We all like to think about career and, and you know salary and benefits and what, what it means for career growth, but I think there's a whole host of other factors that matter. And so what do I mean by that? Uh, so in my process of writing Redefining Success, uh, I did dozens and dozens of interviews of highly quote unquote successful individuals. I share a little bit about my own personal journey. And of course, because of my science background, I wanted to back anything that I was saying with science. Uh, so key things that I wanted to explore was the relationship between success and happiness. Cause you know, if we're not happy, why on earth does it matter if we're successful? Um, I wanted to understand the science of happiness, the science of fulfillment. And then of course, you already saw, I had a lot of pivots in my career and in life. How do we navigate those? And what's the science say around life pivots? And then uh, how do we overcome tough times in life? And that last one, just a, on a personal anecdote, one of the reasons why I decided to push pause and pursue my MBA and, and uh, write this book, uh, I lost my father to prostate cancer after a two year battle. So that really puts things in perspective. He was relatively young, his early 60s, he hadn't even retired yet, and yet he had been building all sorts of plans for post-retirement. And so we all like to think of ourselves and our careers as we're going to work really hard and work our way up and eventually retire and do the things that we enjoy and want to do, create this bucket list of sorts. And that paradigm no longer worked for me because nothing is guaranteed. You don't know if you can retire. So as Jody and I were already talking about, you know, one of the things I love to do is travel. So I went to South Africa this past year doesn't mean I don't work hard. It doesn't mean that I don't, you know, I put in the hours at the office, but it means that I need to find the right balance for me so I can travel. I can spend time with my friends and my family. Uh, so along within the book, hopefully these will, some of these names will resonate. I interviewed Apollo Ono. He's the most decorated winter, U.S. Winter Olympian of all time with eight medals. Uh, Ariana Huffington's in the book and her story about how she was, burning the candle at both ends so much that she woke up in a pool of her own blood. Uh, she had collapsed from sheer exhaustion from how much she was working. So she needed to redefine what success meant for her. Uh, literally the inventor of the term FOMO, so fear of missing out. Uh, he is actually a Georgetown alum, funny enough, uh, but now he's a Renaissance man. He also had a health crisis. He was in investment banking during uh, the Great Recession, and woke up on a heart monitor based on all the stress that he exhibited. Uh, this man you may not know, he is actually the founder of High West Distillery. Uh, he sold his distillery for $160 million, but he actually started his career at Amgen and Genentech. So he was a biopharmaceutical. Uh, he did both in the lab, but also business roles there. So he took his passions for science and business and made his own distillery. Uh, this person, Marissa Fernandez, she was climbing the corporate ladder in marketing, uh, even working for the NFL as in the corporate suite, and decided to go pursue a role as an executive coach on the back end. And finally, uh, if any of you are fantasy football fans, uh, Matthew Barry had a one-on-one -on -one interview with him as well. He has a really cool story about, he used to work in Hollywood actually, uh, so he was a screenwriter, 
and worked on Married with Children and George Carlin Show and all sorts of wonderful things and decided, well, he was going to pursue a career in fake football. So you see pivots are very natural in your career. All of these folks shared some wonderful anecdotes as well as strategies and tactics that they use to make pivots and to really navigate how they wanted to make set up their personal life with the career. And so that's what I share uh, in the book. And then I back it up with science. So hopefully you all enjoy uh, and, and give it a read. But this lends the question of what is success? And unfortunately, I can't answer that question for you. This is an internal metric. We all like to think that success, if I were to say who is someone that is successful, we're going to think of a Bill Gates. We're going to think of someone that has a lot of money or that is in the news. And I'm here to tell you that if you pursue that and it's not aligned with every other aspect of your life, it's going to feel very hollow. So what the science and the research shows is that success actually contains many, many different facets, one of which is your legacy. So of course, career is tied into that, but these are all actually tied together. And so this is the framework that I suggest at the back end of my book. Uh, I pose all sorts of questions, a framework for you. Um, but in the end, you need to define what success means for yourself in all of these buckets of life, and then find a way to combine them all into something that gives you the balance that you want and that you need. Uh, so that's that's the purpose of hopefully this whole setup is that while you think about your next exciting career opportunity, uh, try to think of it with a more holistic version of success because we all have things that we like to do outside of work and that's really important. So as you think about your next job and as you think about what success means to you, I want you to think about career currencies. And what I mean by this is we all know the easy one, right? That's how much will they pay me to do a job? Some jobs pay really, really well, and some, some pay less. I can tell you that some of my peers leaving the MBA were looking at a quarter million dollars in base salary, and they were going to be making a ton in terms of bonuses. And for them, that mattered a lot. It also meant that they'd be working about 100 hours a week. But they, they decided to make that decision uh, again. Could be a great decision for them. It's not necessarily the biggest driver for me. And the science actually proves that there is a law of diminishing returns after a certain amount of currency. So what else can we think about? Time off and, and setting your own hours potentially. So you know, you know, we all want flexibility. We all want the ability to, to make our own hours. There's actually a lot of science and research that shows this is the number one thing that people care about. It's not as much where we work, but understanding and de determining when we work. Uh, people want flexibility. So whether that matters to you or not, I can't tell you, but think about, think about it and you need to start prioritizing these things as you think about where to apply and what industry to enter. Career growth, uh, you know, early on in your career, I'm sure this really matters. Uh, I can tell you even midway through my career, uh, this matters to me. I, I think about every one of my next steps and where it might lead me, what doors open and what doors potentially close. So something to consider. And I'd encourage you to ask your potential employers in interviews, you know, where do you, if I accept this role, where do you see me in three years and five years? They all, they often like to ask, where do you see yourself in five years? Sometimes I like to flip that, that script because their answers actually tell you how they would plan to develop you and train you. Uh, vacation time, I already alluded, this is very important to me. Uh, it may not be important to you, but think about it as a currency. Uh, people leadership. So this one is, is actually pretty tough to get early in your career, but if you can get it and you like it, this is something that you might want to weigh because it's something that as a future leader in the healthcare space, people will want to see if you can lead teams. And being able to do a job well versus being able to lead a team are two very different skill sets. And so being able to get this early in your career is important if you wanna move up in your career and, and eventually run, run an organization, run a team. Um, so something to consider. Uh, this one is, I really hate being micromanaged. So I can tell you if I've had micromanagers as bosses, I do not do well in those scenarios. So some people love having a list of tasks to pursue and complete. 
I prefer to see big picture and ask questions and, and look at the strategy and then create my own set of tasks and cross-reference them with my manager. So understanding managers is important. Healthcare and other benefits is super important, especially nowadays. Uh, this one I think is really important in, in terms of impact and legacy. So we, I showed you that wheel of what matters to you and what success. And you know, we, in the end, we all want to be remembered a certain way and we all want to make a positive impact on the earth. Uh, I like to think that if you're trying to get into healthcare, you probably really care about impact. You probably have someone in your life that had some serious illness, or maybe you have an illness and, and you want to help rectify that. Um, you know, I think healthcare is a great space to make an impact. This graphic also shows collaboration. Um, you should you should understand if your future job is going to allow you to work on a team or if it's a lot of individual work. And last but not least, assuming my slides will go, there we go. Uh, this is, if you care about it, where you can work. So I can tell you, I get to work from home two days a week. I love that flexibility. Um, jobs are starting to cut back a little bit on that. You can see those in the headlines, but uh, you can still find fully remote work if that's what you, what you care for. You might sacrifice other aspects though, like potential career building or potential salary. So it's all trade-offs. There's pros and cons to each and every one of these. I just ask that you consider all of them when, when making your decisions, not just looking at the big fancy uh, dollar sign that you get. So I'll leave you with what, what matters to you. And again, I can't define that for you, but a really great exercise is to take this list of career currencies and order them in the, in the order of importance to you when you're looking at a job. And do this before you even start applying, or even if you've already started applying, create this independent order. And then as you look at and consider jobs, see how your order actually aligns with the job uh, description and what they're telling you and the offer package. And if it's misaligned, it might not be a great fit. Um, something to consider. All right, so let's go into the meat of the presentation. The rest of this is supposed to give you a very high level of the types of roles that are non-lab based that you could think about in the healthcare sector, particularly in the biotech, um, even nonprofit, academic, or pharma sectors. Uh, I'm happy to touch on others. I've probably partnered with almost every kind of organization you can think of through any of these roles. Um, but I'm going to go at a very high level and then at the end, I'm going to give plenty of time for questions, and I'm happy to dive deeper into any one of these. So the first is academic. Um, academic research is going to be a lot of lab-based jobs. The ones that I encountered that were not lab-based, such as at my time at the Lombardi uh, Cancer Center, you can be a lab manager. You're not necessarily running the experiments then. You're doing more of the day-to-day -day operations, hiring. Uh, you pretty much are a jack-of-all-trades if you're the lab manager of a small lab. It's a great opportunity to get your hands dirty and, and understand what it means to work in a lab setting, which you could translate over to an R&D facility in part biotech or pharma. Clinical trials, these are huge money makers at academic institutions, so you can help be a clinical trial manager. Um, there's a few other roles that you could consider there, but they pretty much handle the operations of the clinical trials at the sites themselves. And then uh, program manager, that's a lot like uh, writing grants, getting funding, working with the PI to make sure that the lights stay on. Um, you also might help with some hiring there. And lastly, here is the patent office. This one's particularly interesting if you're thinking about a future law degree or if you wanna work in business development, um, I will say, or even in venture capital, a lot of early, early companies come from inventions that come out of academic institutions. Those academic institutions then set up a patent right away, and then they sell that patent or license it, um, or sometimes even spin out their own company. So patent office is a cool way to get uh, your hands dirty with some of the technology going on. Uh, I see you off mute, Jody. So really quick, Mike, would you mind, because we have both undergrad and grads on this um, session, would you mind sharing which ones are specifically an undergrad could apply for after graduation if they're interested? Yes. Go through all the jobs, that would be really helpful. Thanks. 
Yeah, no problem. Uh, so the big ones here for undergrads in particular would be the clinical trial manager or the patent office. Um, the clinical trial managers and the patent offices are they lend themselves well to undergraduates, especially if you're able to get some form of lab experience in undergrad. Uh, you could probably even work in the patent office as an undergrad part-time. Um, program manager and lab manager, you'll probably need a bit more either experience or an advanced degree. Um, apologies, I didn't put it on here. My future slides do have little asterisks where it says advanced degree helpful, uh, but I didn't do it here, so good call out. Uh, so working through my career journey, so at the biotech and the diagnostics company, so this, again, this, just to give context, it's a, this was a 500 person biotech, the larger the company, the more different functions that you're going to find, right? Because they're going to have the same capabilities of, as large pharma. So if you don't see something here, but you've seen a job description uh, that doesn't necessarily align with one of these it's probably because it's a striker, one of these large, large biotechs, and they operate a lot like a pharmaceutical company. So um, this is not supposed to be every representation. This is more what I've seen with my experience. Um, so anything in light blue that you see, these are going to be more lab-based jobs. I put them here just to be a bit uh, more complete. Uh, in the end, most of the products and most of the development work gets done by these light blue roles. Uh, the other ones are the, the non-lab based uh, that I'll touch on a bit more. Um, so at a biotech and frankly at any company uh, that's of a certain size, you're going to have business development there. What you're looking for is opportunities to license, opportunities to purchase or merge or acquire certain technologies. Um, you're going to have certain types of roles that you'll see pretty consistent across the board. I call these enabling functions, not to say they're crucial to the day-in-day -day operation. What I mean by enabling function is they're a little bit more product agnostic. They help keep the lights on. They make sure that the products get to the customers and that everything is done compliantly and, and done uh, with SOPs in place. So things like finance, operations, change management, supply chain and procurement, all of those are crucial roles. and. No matter where you work, you're gonna run into these. So I wanna call them out here, but I'm not gonna go too deeply into them because you can find those at almost any company. Uh, if you're interested in business, you can get a marketing role. I put an asterisk here as an advanced degree. That really depends on the size of the company. If you want to get your hands dirty with marketing early, I'd recommend getting a few undergraduate um, basic business classes under your belt. And then you could probably work at smaller companies to do this. There's also a few companies, even within the pharmaceutical sector, that have leadership development programs specifically for undergrads. They're typically uh, commercial driven. Um, they might also make you start in sales. So if you're interested in a biotech that has an LDP or that has marketing or sales, that's a good way to get your foot in the door as an undergrad. Uh, scientific affairs, you're gonna need most likely a PhD to go do that. But since we have some graduate students, figured I'd call it out. You're gonna be doing all sorts of research, um, both from uh, internal perspective, but also looking externally at like real world data, trying to supplement whatever developed R&D data is out there. You're trying to supplement it with real world, how are customers using our data? That's what Scientific Affairs is looking at. Uh, the PMO office, again, that's one of those enabling functions, but crucial. Uh, they, they make things run very tightly. You might want to get a project management certificate if you're going to consider something like that. Uh, you can become one of those fancy uh, black belts, a Six Sigma black belt, and they will teach you all about how to make things hyper efficient, which is great. Sales, uh, one thing that I learned and I didn't know about early in my career, uh, you can do internal sales. Uh, I always used to think sales, you had to go door to door or lab to lab to make your sales. There are folks that work internally to either support the external sort of sales team or they follow up on leads internally as well. So something to consider if you don't necessarily want to travel, you can do sales that way. Communications, if you like writing, if you, if you want to be close to marketing, but you don't necessarily want to do the marketing, Communications is typically more corporate level, like press releases and things like that. Uh, you're working with outside agencies, but uh, potentially it's a great place to go. 
and product management. Uh, this one, very helpful to have an MBA. You're gonna own the product or a particular set of products from end to end. So you're dealing directly with customers to define what products are needed, what changes are needed to current products and also help define what future products are needed. You also might be responsible for profit and loss for that given product, how you spend the money within the organization. That's a really cool role. It's uh, frankly something that I'm doing now, so I'm a bit biased, but uh, I do think it's pretty cool. All right, so moving on to a nonprofit, not all nonprofits are the same. You're gonna see something like, you know, the American Cancer Society is a massive organization, um, all sorts of roles available. This was a small nonprofit, but same basic principles apply. Uh, nonprofits, uh, one thing I wanna call out for business development here, Nonprofits call fundraising business development. So if you see a role that says business development, you're not trying to acquire technology because you're not really commercializing anything. You're more trying to make sure you have partners. Uh, maybe you're setting up events or fundraising for them. So just one thing to keep in mind around nonprofits. Um, the other thing that I wanna call out here is the project management and program management. Typically, nonprofits are where pharmaceuticals and biomet and biotechs go to donate money to help solve tough problems that they can't necessarily solve on their own. So it could be helping with patient advocacy work, something where, you know, compliantly, biotech and pharma need to keep an arm's length away from specific patients, um, but we can help to enable and make sure that we have the patient's voices heard. Um, so a lot of nonprofits work on advocacy work. They also help you know, the FNIH, for instance, we worked on Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and some oncology products where, you know, there have been so many clinical trial failures that we've seen a lot of companies shy away from certain types of products. Well, a good way to de-risk them is to say, okay, well, let's create a partnership with three other pharma companies. A nonprofit will be our neutral convener. And then we can solve the problem that way as a collective to move the science forward. So um, something to consider. Technical writers also a really good avenue to get your hands dirty, even as I put advanced degree helpful. Um, some of the better the technical writing organizations do require an advanced degree, like some will hire PhDs. There are some where you might be able to help work on technical writing as an undergraduate. So something I want to caveat there. All right, so this is my second to last slide. I know I've gone a bit longer than I had hoped, but I uh, want to make sure that I give you a nice flavor. So Janssen, massive, massive company, Johnson & Johnson. We haven't spun off our consumer division yet, but we're at 135 or 140,000 people. So very different scale compared to the rest. Uh, the pharmaceuticals arm is probably about 20 to 25,000 people, uh, but you can see, it encompasses a lot of different roles. Uh, we do everything from drug target discovery through commercialization on the back end, through you know patent loss and loss of exclusivity. So we manage everything, uh, and we partner externally a lot. So the next slide is a lot about external. One thing I want to call out: um, all major pharma, lots of major biotech have their own venture capital arm. So. If you're interested in venture capital, you can do it at a venture capital company. You can also do it at a large company. That's where a lot of our external innovation comes from. Um, so something to consider is venture capital. Additionally, once we invest in a company, uh, we do what, we, what I call incubator management. Effectively, we incubate those companies to help them grow and bring their technology to life. So we have something called J Labs. Um, Frankly, the J Labs, we don't even invest in those companies yet. We're just building relationships. And then we have the opportunity to invest in them in the back end. But again, we have whole teams that their whole job is to help these startups grow. And this is true both within J and J, other large pharmas, but also venture capital firms themselves. Again, business development here is the more traditional sense. This is where we're licensing and acquiring different assets. Uh, we do have a uh, patient engagement team as well. What that means is early on during the clinical trials, I, I talked previously at the academic centers about clinical trial managers, our patient engagement team will help coordinate with them, make sure that patients are being having their voices heard during the product development process. 
In the middle here, you see a lot of those enabling functions that I called out before with a few more sprinkled in, such as policy. I think I saw a grad student coming from the School of Policy. Um, there's a few different roles there. So one, we do do some lobbying work <laughs> within Capitol Hill. So being in Washington, DC, every pharma company, biotech company has a office in the city where our policy teams sit. So something to consider. The other thing that is very strong in policy are trade organizations. I have them called out in the next slide, but things like Pharma, the trade organization, P-H-R-M-A and Bio um, are two massive trade organizations and they lobby as well on our behalf and help to inform policy. They also help to translate policy. So uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which just passed this past year, massive, massive in implications on our product development, what we decide to invest in, how we can commercialize products, our policy teams are the ones that are taking the charge of informing us of, well, what are the key implications of this new legislation? How should it inform our decision-making so that we can then make business decisions in-house? So hopefully that gives a nice flavor for policy. Um, supply chain and procurement, as you all know, through COVID, um, very, very crucial. And I'll say has an extra wrinkle in pharma, there are many, many, many middlemen and players to consider. Uh, they're all partners, but things that we need to consider. Uh, just to give you an example, if I do go work on CAR-T, uh, it takes us six weeks from extracting a patient's own blood to then shipping it to a lab, having it bioengineered, shipping it back to the patient. All of that has to be done through supply chain with very, very specific conditions, our supply chain and procurement team is crucial to doing that. And we should, we have to be able to do that across the globe. Really, really cool work that they do. Regulatory, legal, and healthcare compliance. Um, that's another avenue where you might be able to get in early. Um, you'll be doing a bit more support work if you get in there early. Uh, an advanced degree is helpful if you want to become a leader there. Uh, but being in pharma, heavy regulated space, you, we need to do pretty much everything through regulatory, legal, and healthcare compliance. Um, some of these I've already touched on. One role that I've actually seen, I put an asterisk here because it's helpful. One role I've actually seen quite a few undergrads come in through is analytics. So as I mentioned, if you're good at spreadsheets, if you're good at looking at big amounts of data and coming to insights and like key actionable things from that data. Our analytics group is a great way to get in to pharma. Um, it's actually more difficult at J&J &J to get into marketing than it is to get into analytics. So if you can, if you have strong uh, quali uh, quantitative skills, analytics might be a way for you to get in. Marketing, you either need quite a bit of experience or an MBA to get in for Janssen's purposes. Uh, the last bit I'll call out here it has to do with medical affairs, something I haven't touched on yet. There, you typically do need either an MD or a PhD, or I've seen an MD, MBA, MD, PhDs, uh, quite a bit of, of uh, extra graduate degrees there, but they help to inform our clinical trials. They are the ones who are getting our clinical trial sites up and running. They're the ones who are working with other uh, investigators to get crucial data out in the world. Um, very crucial part pre-launch. Our medical affairs team is, is very important to our success within, within pharma. All right, and last but not least, uh, here's a non-existent list of pharma partners. Um, so these are different external third parties that I have worked with in my 12 year career, um, largely at Janssen, but everywhere. So you have you know government agencies like FDA, CMS, um, those are great ways to get your foot in the door. Healthcare consulting, I know is hiring undergrads. I uh, actually just met with an undergrad I met during our last talk, Jody, and, and she he got a, a few offers from healthcare consulting companies. Uh, these small boutique companies are a great way to get a broad range of experiences in the healthcare setting. You'll have probably three to six month projects and you'll be working with all sorts of pharma partners. It's also a great way to be almost like a pseudo audition to eventually get a pharma job. Uh, I know that at Janssen, we've hired three different consultants that I've worked with personally for internal roles. So a uh, great way to, to make those connections and network. Management consulting, I know one of you mentioned you wanted to get your hands dirty there. 
an MBA is very helpful. I know they do do undergraduate uh, recruiting as well, but to get to one of those top management consulting firms, they typically want an advanced degree, an MBA, a PhD, uh, or at the very least a master's. Um, we have all sorts of agencies doing creative work for us, market research specialists. So these are companies that will go talk to patients on our behalf or do claims analysis to look at how are doctors actually prescribing our medicines or, or our competitors' medicines. Um, so those are really crucial. There are folks that uh, work directly with key opinion leaders to get insights from them and interview them to say, okay, well, how should we be designing our clinical trial or what messages work? Uh, I'm not going to go through each of these. Uh, maybe the last one that I'll touch on, especially for, um, especially for undergrads, I think that the ad agencies and the tech vendors are actually really hungry and growing industries right now. So I know several people that wanted to get into pharma marketing, didn't necessarily want to go get their MBA. And so they entered through an ad agency. Through that, especially if you're working on healthcare specific products, you get to work directly with our pharma team. I can tell you our ad agencies on any given brand actually have J&J &J email addresses and they're effectively one of our own. And so again, you get to network, you get to work on the brand, you get to work on our strategy. Um, that's a great place. Tech vendors, if you like more the intersection of tech and healthcare, so think about apps, think about website design, um, software as a service, we partner extensively with these. And I'm talking about everything from clinical trial design to patient advocacy websites to how do we have patient reported outcomes, both pre-launch and post-launch. Um, so we do some really cool work with them. And I also know we've hired folks from our tech vendor. So great ways to get in. Um, I think I'll leave it there. I, I can share these slides with everyone just so that you're all aware. RA Capital is a venture capital group. They have this great um, map of what to do with a bio degree. And one of them, yes, is I enjoy doing the science and these are gonna be lab-based like research, things like that. But then you also have science and marketing, um, if you want to do survey and landscapes, if you want to do healthcare regulatory. So it pretty much gives you a series of questions to help decide, well, where should you start looking and what keywords can you use? And what even at the very end, what companies can you consider going to work for? So this is a free resource on the RA Capital website. I've embedded it in this PowerPoint. I'll share it with Jody after this. Um, but if you have no clue where to go and what you want to do, uh, this is a great start. I also know Jody has a wonderful survey through a website, which I took personally. I know it's mainly for PhDs, um, but it was great. I actually took it and my top option, it says you should go do marketing. And here I am doing commercial work for a pharma organization in their marketing uh, function. So uh, it was pretty spot on based on the things that I like. Um, so what's next for you? First and foremost, please, 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 um, you're at the stage of your career where you can prioritize what you mat what matters to you. Um, you know, I, th I think the job market might be getting a little more difficult now, so you might not be able to be as picky, but at least think through what success means to you in all these different facets, and then what career currencies matter to you when thinking about your first job or your next job. Additionally, I like to encourage anyone that I mentor or anyone I have a career conversation with to build a career toolbox. Um, so what does that mean? It means building different skills. So I already mentioned, if you can be really good at PowerPoint and Excel, those are skills. If you can build websites, that's a skill. One great way to do that, unfortunately, unfortunately, is through consulting, you will build a ton of skills. Uh, you'll work many hours, most likely, but you'll build a lot of different skills very quickly. So early in your career, um, if you're into travel, if you want to grow quickly, I encourage consulting. Later in your career, if you're trying to settle down with a family, it might become more difficult. So think about that. Last but not least, network, network, network. Um, I, I literally block off probably 10 to 20% of my time in any given week to try to have networking calls or to just go get lunch with colleagues or with past colleagues. Um, some weeks I'm better than others, but 
this is how the world goes round. When opportunities present themselves or become available, I hear of them first before they're even posted, um, which is really cool and has led to me getting some cool, unique opportunities. So continue to network, um, leverage Jody, leverage myself, leverage your alumni network. Uh, and lastly, connect. I put two email addresses here. I'm happy to have a general career chat with any of you. Use my Georgetown email for those. Um, I like to say it should be a good fit both ways. So I'm not trying to push everyone to come to Janssen. It works for me. Uh, I like the values and I like the work, um, but it's not certainly not for everyone. Uh, so if you want to talk general careers, reach me at Georgetown. If you want to come work at J&J &J or you find something that's interesting to you on the J&J &J, uh, website, uh, shoot me an email at my J&J &J email address. I can certainly help to either talk through the role or even set you up with the hiring manager potentially. So um, with that, I'll stop. We can cut it, the recording, and I can take questions. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to keep the recording on in case others may want to hear this, but two roles, if you could expand on. One is the patient experience. I've had students interested in those in the past. And then we have a question about just learning more about VC within a pharma company and how they differ than private VC companies. Okay, perfect. All right. So um, the patient experience team is a bit different than the patient engagement team I talked about before. Patient experience is everything post um, post prescription. So once a doctor prescribes our medicine, we have services set up for those patients. And that's exactly what the patient experience team does. And they try to make it as smooth a process as possible, right? So we're talking about, um, you know, whether they need copay assistance programs, if sometimes we offer an infusion at someone's home, uh, we can offer transportation to sites. Those types of experiences, the reason I say post prescription is they cannot be a reason for a doctor to prescribe a drug. We cannot market those things. They're not things that we can actively go out and tell patients about. It's after they're prescribed the drug. It's how can we make the patient experience both in terms of first use of our drug as well as continued use of our drug. How can we make that experience as smooth and seamless as possible? And if financial assistance is needed, how do we make sure that they get that assistance so that the patient gets the drug no matter what? Uh, really cool roles. I can tell you the work for that starts pre-launch. Uh, we've actually started working with our patient experience team for that drug I'm working on. And we started that three years pre-launch because we're thinking about how do we make sure that if you're six hours away from the nearest infusion center, how do we make sure that you can still get the IV at your house? Or, you know, if you can't, you know, sit at the doctor's office for two hours, how do we make, how can we shorten that time? Anyway, we, we try to ask these tough questions and talk to patients to make sure it's as smooth as possible. In terms of VC internally versus externally, I like to, so the fundamental aspects of them are the same in that an external VC typically has a group, a, like a, a portfolio that they're looking to fill. They will go get external dollars from funders. So there's a, there's a role where you can go work with external funding uh, and try to do business development. That way, it's typically larger sums of money at VC levels, could even be pension funds. Um, but what they're trying to do is create a portfolio of products. Some are very healthcare specific, some are not. If it's a healthcare specific portfolio, they might have some targets, but what they're trying to do is find, for lack of better words, the next Google of healthcare, right? They're trying to not necessarily get all winners. They're trying to get the high upside, but potentially high risky, high risk um, companies in their portfolio. So they'll invest in them, they'll grow them. And then there are different types of venture capitalists. So there's uh, different series. So you can be a seed, round, which is very early stage. You might be pre-proof of concept, or you might have some very limited data and you're trying to expand that data set. A series A is a certain valuation, so a certain size company that you will invest in, series B, series C, and eventually IPO. Uh, what that means is each one is tolerating more or less risk. They're targeting different size companies. And in the end, their goal is to get that company to the next series or to a public offering. That company, uh, VC, the whole thing is to get a return on investment for whatever they put into the company to help it grow. And yes, they have operations management experience and they have ways to scale, 
but oftentimes they're just influxing that um, company with cash. Internal VC at Janssen, what we are doing is we have certain strategic priorities into what we're trying to expand into, where we see commercial opportunity, and we are investing in companies where we think there's commercial opportunity and it fits within our portfolio strategy. Most of the time, we are trying to bring these companies to market ourselves. It doesn't mean that we won't sell our share of a company at a later round. Our strategic priorities shift all the time. The, the science might change, but typically the goal is if we're investing in a company through our venture capital arm, we're trying to grow it, but we're also trying to make it commercialized in-house. And so it becomes part of our pipeline.